I'm glad to be here. I've been watching, I've been creeping on you guys online for like since you started. And uh, my name is Austin Basil. I'm the pastor at Cross the Line Church in Lincoln, which was just a, its own plant about uh, 10 years ago uh, in a few weeks. So, um, like I said, I was Alex's youth pastor, so um, sorry about that, you know. Uh, if you heard stories, that uh, they're, some of them are true, probably. But I know a lot of the, pe- uh, at least some people here, and I'm so proud of this, uh, this church plant. It's, uh, it's so good to see uh, what's going on here at um, Revival and uh, just, just in the heart and the life of the church. And uh, I'm just honored to be here, so thank you for letting me come. You didn't know about it, but thank you for letting me uh, speak this morning anyway. Um, so one of the things that um, we've been working through at Cross the Line and, and I want to bring to you today is that um, <clears throat> it's kind of a unique season because... Uh, it's an awkward time, Christmas, uh, the time of Christ for the church. Uh, nobody knows what to do with Christmas, right? Because maybe some of you, this is like um, your first or second time here. I know uh, as a church plant, uh, we've got to see all kinds of new people, and a lot of them came to us in this stage when we were just uh, meeting. We also met at a wedding hall, uh, not nearly as nice as this one. Um, and uh, it, 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 you just get permission to invite. <clears throat> but the church, sometimes we don't know what to do with Christmas because the subject matter is kind of fixed, right? And the songs are fixed. And, so, and, and sometimes people only come uh, to church at Christmas and Easter. And I, I can tell you, being a pastor um, full-time since 1998 and, and in my college years in 93, uh, it's kind of the same old thing unless you get inventive. And so one of the things I'd like for us to think about this morning is um, at, the, at the Jesus' birth, uh, people in Israel knew he was on his way. And there's a couple of different things. If you look at your Bible, they knew the Messiah was coming. They didn't know exactly when. They knew when he would present himself. And um, there's about 300 prophecies in the Old Testament where it talks about the birth and the life and uh, the death of Jesus. Um, But for every one of those, there's eight about how he's coming back, right? And so there's two thoughts. Uh, When we look at our Bible, Jesus was on his way. And for us today, he's on his way. And and, and so there's a couple things in... in, uh, They knew the day that the Messiah would present himself. So uh, in Daniel chapter 9, you can go look it up this week if you're doing some Bible study. Daniel gave a prophetic message about the Messiah. He said he would arrive 476 years after there was a decree to build Jerusalem and its walls. I don't know if you knew that, but that that happened. So... Uh, The day that decree happened was 445 B.C. 445 B.C., from the outskirts of Rome, it was announced, hey, we're going to build Jerusalem and its walls. So uh, the timer started. And 476 years later, to the day that Daniel said, Jesus rode into town on a donkey. That's amazing. So they knew he was coming. They knew he was coming. But what were they doing when they... Now, the average um, kid that was going to grow up and he was in the right line and he went to the right house, he had the first five books of the Bible memorized by the age 12. A lot of them. You can't tell me they didn't read Daniel. They knew about it. And so they knew he was coming and the Pharisees and Sadducees knew he was coming. But what did Jesus find them doing? So when he was born, not everybody was happy about it. So when we think about this, let's also think about gifts, okay? Um, This is the season of gifts. Of course, we're not just worried about it for the gifts because we love the Lord, right? But some of you are great gift givers, and some of you aren't very good at it, okay? Let's just, let's just, I mean, it's church. We can be real, right? Church plants, time just lay it bare. Um, I'm on the I try side. Okay, and I think it's important if we're going to talk about the gift of Christ, you need to think about the best gift you ever got 
and the worst gift you ever got. So I thought I'd share my two, uh, reveal a little bit of my faults in life. And, uh, my two happened back to back by my mom and stepdad, okay? Uh, and I, when I was, uh, I, I grew up on a farm in Kansas from third grade uh, through high school and college. And uh, so we're out on the farm and I am, uh, I don't know if, it, where you grew up or how, it, but listen, back in the 80s, uh, there was something that happened in every classroom uh, when you're a boy. You're sitting there and all of a sudden, these little children start talking about how they killed a deer last weekend, right? They start getting, they go from like playing with toys to hunting big game, right? And so I'm on the farm and I've, I've been there, you know, a year and a half, two years, and I'm thinking, okay, mom, I want a bow and arrow, right? I have friends in my class, they're talking about the bow that they're going to get, and then they're going to go deer hunting, right? And then this is going to be so awesome. So I'm like, I want that. Well, uh, I saw that my mom had put a, a present that looked like a bow and arrow. I didn't really know how it would be packaged and all that stuff. And I acted like I didn't care. It's like, whatever, will be fine. I was lying, you know. I wanted it to be a bow and arrow. And so I opened it, and it was a bow and arrow, the kinds with the uh, Looney Tunes suckers on the end of it that you can shoot your sliding glass door with. That was the worst Christmas as far as expectation. Now, it was preceded by the best one. And I don't know how old you are, but if you're a child of the 80s, you understand getting home from school and watching He-Man on cartoons, right? Maybe even black and white. He-Man was a big deal. To, uh, and one, the Christmas uh, before that, uh, I got the Castle Grayskull, right? And Castle Grayskull would be a terrible gift today fantastic then. Had a trap door. The guys could fit through it. It was, a, you know, we got action figures. They're not dolls. They're action figures, okay? They had, and it was fantastic. And every gift I opened had to, it could fit and it could go in Castle Grace. So it was the greatest gift, followed by the worst gift. And, and I think you, you got to see, okay, what was going on uh, when Jesus arrived? Not everybody was happy about it. And, and so the, these two thoughts, right? Um, that Jesus was on his way, and he is on his way. That, that's a thought that should never leave us during this season. And, and um, what does your gut tell you? Are you excited about it, or are you kind of nervous? Uh, are, you know, there's some people that are completely against it. You're probably friends with some of them, or you, you, you get that vibe online. But uh, in, the, in the time where Jesus showed up, not everybody was happy. If we look at Matthew chapter 2, verse 16, it says, Then Herod, when he saw that he'd been tr tricked by the wise men, these wise men were the kingmakers from Babylon. They had probably set under um, the biblical teaching of Daniel. This would, this would go back to the time of Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and Daniel. And these guys knew when they saw the heavenly host in the sky that they were supposed to go. They were the kingmakers of Babylon. That's why they're called the wise men. They tricked Herod, and he became furious, and he sent and he killed all the male children in Bethlehem. We think we kind of have oppressive government sometimes. Try this one, right? And, and, um, and in all the region who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had ascertained from the wise men, the wise men were expecting him, right, his birth, but Israel was also expected. This is why people were trying to say, is this the Messiah? Here he is. Where is he at? And they were looking for him. This is why tens of thousands of people, when Jesus started announcing his ministry and performed miracles, this is why they showed up in massive numbers. This is why, because they knew they were coming. Uh, Herod knew he was coming and tried to kill him tried to stop the promise of Jesus. Unbelievable. Um, I think we would say, I would never do something like that. And then you see, well, what were the people who were in charge of God's house doing? You know, because um, they also weren't very happy. You start looking through the scriptures, uh, the people that knew the scriptures the best, if they started their timer when Daniel told them to, they knew that he was going to ride into town uh, sometime soon. They knew that he had probably been born. In fact, they knew he was probably in the temple. Look at Matthew 21, 12 through 13. 
This is one of two examples where Jesus cleanses the temple. It says, Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who sold and bought in the temple. He overturned the tables, the money changers, and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers. (laughs) Interesting. Jesus was on his way. They knew the Messiah was on his way. And what were they doing? They were still living for the world. They were cheating people in the temple. They were robbing people. People had to come in for all kinds of offerings. You can do this study in your Old Testament. They had sin offerings, right? They had all, about four different kinds of major offerings. They needed an exchange, and the money, ro- the money changers were robbing them, even though they were expecting the Messiah to show up. So you have, you have people that knew Jesus was on his way, and they weren't excited about it. And, and I think this goes back to um, you kind of have to look at uh, what happened to the people that were excited about it. Well, I don't know if uh, we get back to the gift thing. I don't know if you're excited about the gifts that you're given this year. I, I, have, um, I think it's more fun when people are excited about the season of Christ. It's not about gifts, but it's fun to give them. And, and, and some of you are so thoughtful, right, that you're like, uh, people wait for the gift that you're going to give them. They wait for it. It's, it's amazing. You're, you're, you're part of the church that has gifts I I don't have. I'm trying to get to where you're at, right? I'm praying. I'm repenting for my past Christmases, right? Okay, so one year, um, again, uh, they came out with the remakes or or the prequels of Star Wars, right? I don't know if you're involved in popular culture. Uh, They were a little disappointing, right? They were a little disappointing. Uh, I was kind of geek out on them because, you know, when I was a little kid, it was, that was the only good movie, you know. They didn't have any good movies in the 80s, I guess. But, but anyway, we were excited about Star Wars, and um, the movies weren't very good, but the toys were fantastic. And so I was excited to get my kids uh, the drone Millennium Falcon. I mean, <laughs> that thing was good. And so I, I, I looked at that, I saw that in the store, I was like, wait, a drone and it's also the Millennium Falcon? I, I'm going to get this for my children because I want them to play with it, right? I mean, I was so excited for them to watch me play with their toy all Christmas Day that I got it for them. And I was so excited, I got it out of the package and, you know, I kicked the little one out of the way and I plugged it in the wall and I'm like, we're going to play with that. And then um, they're like, Dad, Dad, can we play with it? And sure, as soon as the battery runs out, it'll be my turn. And so we, we uh, all day, we're playing with the Millennium Falcon. If you don't know what that is, look up and Google it, okay? And, and uh, this was the greatest thing. We flew it around the house, and about the third time we had charged it up on Christmas Day, it ran into the ceiling fan and hit the floor, and that stupid thing broke, okay? And my kids were really crushed, that my kids were really crushed. That that thing didn't like. And, and I think that's what was going on at the time uh, that, that the Messiah came, that Jesus came. I think that's what was happening. You know, what had happened is the Pharisees and people of Israel and Herod had traded God's eternal gifts for worldly toys. <laughs> you know, toys don't really, I mean, you can get the greatest gift ever. And, and uh, you know, a couple years later, you, you'd be selling that thing at a garage sale, Right? It, it can make a kid so happy. That's fake. That kid, three, you, even, even like me, you know, I go to my, mom, my uh, mom and stepdads, the, and then I go to my dad's stepmom. I didn't care about the presents I got the first round. I'm ready for the second round, right? And, and, and the toys you get, it'll be so good. Oh, it's the best toy. You sing a song about it. You praise God. And listen, it's going to break. And, and so even when they knew that the Messiah was on his way, that Jesus was on his way. They were caught living for worldly toys that, that were not going to last. And so I think um, what we have to do is uh, we have to look at what was going on. In Jeremiah 3, 6 through 8, it says, The Lord said to me in, in, the, uh, in the days of King Josiah, Have you seen what she did, that faithless one, Israel, how she went up on every high heel under every green tree, and there played the whore. And I thought that after she done this, after she's done this, she will return to me, but she did not return to me. What had happened here is the northern house of Israel, Israel was split up into two sections. 
uh, northern house of Israel and Judah, which is why we call uh, the people in Israel the Jews today. Uh, they had cheated on God with other uh, lesser gods, other heavenly hosts that were, people would call fallen angels, and they had cheated on God for 700 years, and he'd had enough. And this is why there is such a great thing when Jesus came back. People say, did Jesus have to come and die on the cross? He had to. Why? Because of this passage. Some people miss it. Let's read it together. But she did not return, and her treacherous sister Judah, so see, we're, we're talking about both wars. She saw that the adulteries of the faithful one, Israel had sent her away with a decree of divorce. Now, I'm not sure if you know this, but the decree of divorce is for marriage in the Old Testament, but it's also the covenant between God and his people. And when, and when God himself gave Israel this decree of divorce on paper in Jeremiah 3, 6 through 8, uh, they were no longer in covenant together. And in the Old Testament, what you'll read is that if the husband gives the wife the decree of divorce, she is not free to marry unless the husband dies. This is why Jesus had to be born and live and die on the cross. Because there is no way the covenant, there could be a new covenant without uh, the death of the husband. So he says, yet her treacherous sister Judah did not fear. She went to and, and did the same things. And so at this time, if you look um, in Israel, you can see there was Asherah worship at every high place and under every tree. There, there were uh, places where they worshiped Baal and Pan. And if you ever do, go on a tour of Israel, you're going to visit these places and see what was going on in the book of Jeremiah. And then in the same book, God tells you what's going to happen. He said in 31, uh, 31 through 34, he says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel. This is the northern house who's given uh, the decree of divorce. The house of Judah, not like the covenant I made with their fathers the day I took them by the hand, bringing them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant that they had broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For this covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them. I'll write it on their hearts. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one uh, teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity, and I'll remember their sin no more. So God says, I'm going to divorce you, but I'm going to make a new covenant. This is why the world should be excited that our culture stops and makes a season of Christ, because we needed him. And they knew he was on his way. They knew he needed it, and he was on his way. They knew they needed Jesus to show up, and that he was on his way. And look what he caught them doing. They were living for temporary things. They were stealing from each other. They were trying to be bought. Herod was like, no, I'm, I'm going to stop that from happening because I like being the steward. I like being kind of the king in this area. And the religious leaders, the Pharisees, they liked the power that they had too, and they weren't excited about the Messiah either. Well, it's kind of good. What was the reactions of people, uh, of entities, and people who knew uh, Jesus better than they did? I, I think it's interesting because when you look um, at the Christmas story, you get some insight into this. Uh, look at Luke chapter 2, 13 through 15. And suddenly, there was with the angel a, a, a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, now, who are these? these are people who are with God every day at his feet, worshiping, uh, carrying out duties. Angel is a job description in the Bible. It's a messenger. And so, uh, what did they do? They worshiped him. Glory to God in the highest on earth. Uh, peace among those who he is well pleased. And the angels went away from them into heaven. And the shepherds said, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that's happened, which the Lord has made known to us. What did the heavenly host do? They worshiped him. They were ready for him, and they were praising him. And, and so we see that. And, and then the, uh, we see that the uh, wise men, they traveled. They, they traveled right away. They went to go, go see him. And then the shepherds who were excited about they went to see him. What did they do when they saw him? They worshiped him. They brought gifts. In Matthew 25, 14 through 30, we get to uh, 
an area in the Bible that's about us. Now, we've been talking about what they did when Jesus was on his way, right? Um, they weren't all excited. Uh, the common person was worshiping uh, false gods, uh, so much so under every tree and, and high place. Uh, they were doing, <clears throat> at Caesarea Philippi, they were, they were sacrificing children and animals to the god of Pan, and, and um, yet they knew that they needed a Messiah. They needed that new covenant, and we live under that new covenant. And for every one verse that talks about Jesus coming the first time, there's eight that talk about his second coming. So he's on his way. What will he find us doing? Well, there's a scripture about that. There's more than one. But if you look and examine, there is this scripture that talks about money. It's Matthew 25, 14 through 30. It's, it's, it's might be, the heading in your Bible might be the parable of talents. Now, some people, when they read the scripture, they're like, I use my talent for God, or I want to. Like, right, Alex might have somebody come up and say, I want to use all my talents, like the scripture says, because I'm a great singer. And you might have been uh, the person that went to American Idol, and they made fun of later, because you, what you thought was a talent really was tone deaf, right? You can't be on this worship team, they're too good, and you're going to have to pick something else to do. This, this scripture's not talking about talent. This is talking about money. Talent at this time is, 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 a, is a word for a coin and money. And so it says, for it will be like a man, speaking about our time, going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted them to his property. One he gave five talents, another two, another one, and each according to his ability. When he went away, the one who had received five talents went at once and traded with them, and he made five more. Also the one that had two made two more. But the one who received one dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. Now, after a long time, the master came back to settle the accounts with him. And the one who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered me the five talents. Here's what I've made, five talents more. His master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. Every Christian wants to hear this. We are to die tomorrow and be in the presence of the Lord. This is the verse that every longtime Christian talks about. This verse is the least about money and a lot of other things. Growing God's kingdom. If you're going to be a part of a church plant, which I think all of you are awesome for being here, I think the leadership has done a fantastic job, you're interested in growing God's kingdom. This is at least about that. You've been faithful over little, and I'll set you over much. Enter the joy of your master. This is eternity. Enter on in. Look what you did. And he said with the one of two talents, Master, you delivered me two I made two more. His master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over little. I'll set you over much. Enter the joy of your master. <clears throat> he, he also who received one talent came, master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow, gathering where you scattered no seed. I was afraid, and I hid your talent in the ground. Here, have what is yours. But his master answered him, you wicked and slothful servant. You know... I reap where I have not sown, and I gather uh, where I scattered no seed. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers. And at my coming, you should have received what was mine with interest. So take the talent from him, give it to him who has ten. For everyone who has will be given more, and he has an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness, the place where they'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is an uncomfortable verse for us because this is what Jesus is going to find some of us doing. And the guy with one piece, one coin, right? Um, that way the Bible tells us is broad and a lot of people find that. Well, what does that talk about? Well, at least it's talking about this, that you got the message of the kingdom and you did nothing with it. You did not accept Jesus' free gift of salvation. You did not grow the kingdom. Bye. You didn't enter the, the covenant with God. God is not your God and you're not his people. But people who do say yes to the free gift of salvation and do start growing God's kingdom, uh, they, they're well done, good and faithful servant. So I think they're, you know, in the Christmas season, this is a great time to reflect. I think there's two groups of people that miss the Christmas 
uh, season. I think, first of all, if you're not a believer, um, why? You know, uh, if, if you come to church a couple times a year around uh, Christmas and Easter, uh, you've missed out. You came for the same songs and the same subject, and you're missing the point. Accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Be born again. Repent, right? And, and, and make Jesus your Lord. And the other one is Christians who think they've already known everything. You don't, you don't think that, that you need to, um, to rededicate parts of your life. And here's what's so great. The people who were expecting Jesus when he was on his way to this earth, the, the people who did it right, the Bible talks about, they brought gifts, right? They worshiped him. And what can we do? Because he's on his way. So much so that the Bible tells us eight times as much as the first time. What should we do? We should um, honor him with more of him, less of us. We should find parts that we keep and we hold on in our personal life and we say for me, this, this, God, this part's for me. No, your whole life belongs to God. And as, as your whole spiritual walk as a believer if you've been a believer for 40 years or four years, it's going to be the same. You're going to get better at giving your life to God if you do it right. And the Christmas season, there should be some focus. Why? Because they missed some things that we have the opportunity to grab a hold of. Uh, they didn't take the opportunity all through Jesus' life, the time when he was getting ready for his great accomplishment on the cross for us so we could enter a new covenant. Now, all the nations... Uh, have this blessing that was promised to Abraham, right? Through the new covenant of, of Jesus, the bridegroom of the church. And we know that Jesus is on his way. People are fascinated with the end of time, uh, end times topic. They'll go to classes and, and watch long videos. But I'll tell you, if you pull out and somebody hits you, the end of time for you is right then. And so what will God find you doing because he's on his way? And so as, as we get ready for some prayer here to close things out, um, I think that there are two groups that miss it that don't have to. We need to be ready to understand what is God calling me to do? Maybe during worship, maybe during communion, maybe during this message, maybe during this uh, last sermon series that you're in, God has been uh, just tugging on your heart to the power of his Holy Spirit. Hey, uh, do this, help grow God's kingdom this way, give and serve in this way. And, and maybe you've been holding that back. Well, I think this is a great time to give uh, the gift of more of your life to God, to worship him in spirit and in truth. We talk about that. What's the truth of your life? Do you have a lot uh, that you just play church on Sunday, or do you have a lot that God is asking you to give him and you've just given this much? Well, that's normal in the world. All of us learn how to do that. Through our life, we're really good at uh, holding on to earthly gifts that are, are going to break. Uh, that will leave us sad. We do a lot of chasing happy, and it just leaves us in the gutter. God wants you to have a joy and a peace that comes from him, but it requires that we sacrifice the earthly gifts for the eternal ones that God has for us. And so I don't know where you're at. I, I'm sure you know each other, and, and uh, you, you're, uh, you have part of your family here, or maybe you're here by yourself, but you know what God's calling you to do. You know what the, the, the very specific things in, in your life that God says, lay this down and worship me in spirit and truth. I would just ask that as we pray, that those decisions be made. Your life encourages somebody else to accept Christ or to grow. Your life is wildly important when you come to Christ. Jesus has been planning all of eternity uh, to spend time with you to know you, to love you, to be your God, and for us to be his people. That's a blessing. We need to step up and take that in. Let's pray together. Lord, we love you. Uh, we thank you for today. We thank you for this magnificent group of volunteers that got here early. We thank you for every person that showed up. We thank you for the leaders and elders. We thank you, most of all, for your word. It's absolutely incredible. There's so much in it. And Lord, today, as Revival Church has met together, as we have uh, gathered together, as your word calls us to do, uh, we know that many of us need to take steps towards you. The people who sat at your feet in heaven when, when you arrived, they broke out in worship. They spread your message. They went and brought you gifts 
and bowed down and worshiped you. And Lord, we know that you are on your way again. Find this church bowing down to you, giving the gifts of their life to you. More of you, God, less of us. Our sinful nature is passing away. It's being transformed and renewed. Lord, we thank you for that. I pray for many decisions today. I pray for many Christians who will take the next step. I pray for any believer in here, if you have not accepted the Lord, that you just listen to God's Holy Spirit speaking to you. Lord, we thank you for today. We thank you for the the worship and the message and the communion that's been spoken over us today by your word. We're so grateful. We pray this in the power and in the name of Jesus. Amen.